years. But um, as we move our phone calls from the relative safety of the public switch telephone network to the Internet, to VoIP, that asymmetry collapses. It becomes a level playing field. Now it's possible for anyone to wiretap anyone with approximately equal ease. Um, if one of the PCs in your office building becomes infected with some kind of specially designed spyware, then uh, depending on how your network is connected inside your building, uh, it might be able to intercept the, all the local network traffic, including VoIP traffic, and store that on the disk uh, as WAV files. And then uh, it could organize the WAV files by who's calling who. And somebody from the other side of the world could use a web browser to browse through and find the interesting phone calls and just listen just to those phone calls. Um, this means that someone can wiretap you from the other side of the world. They don't have to be near you. They don't even have to be in the same country. Um, they don't have to get a visa to enter your country. Uh, they, they, you know, they might not be given a visa because actually they're criminals. So um, the threat model for wiretapping in the public switch telephone network was fairly narrow, but the threat model for wiretapping in VoIP is vastly expanded. Um, and so we have to do something about this. It means that, um, you know, a lot of people ask me, uh, well, aren't, aren't, isn't law enforcement going to object to the idea of encrypting uh, VoIP? Well, my answer is that um, when law enforcement realizes that they can be wiretapped by criminals uh, just as easily as they can wiretap the criminals, uh, I think it's going to change the, their perception of it. Um, Organized crime will be able to wiretap prosecutors and judges and listen to them talk about ongoing criminal investigations and, um, the, and learn the names of witnesses and informants and, and listen to them calling their wives at home to ask what time to pick up their kids at school. I think this is going to be a, have a crippling effect on the criminal justice system uh, unless we encrypt VoIP. We have no choice. We have to encrypt VoIP. And I think that law enforcement will, will gradually uh, become aware of this. So, so um, let me talk a bit about the, uh, the ZRTP protocol. There's different ways to encrypt VoIP. And uh, some of the ways that have been considered um, uh, rely on the phone company to do it for you. I mean, for example, SDES is one approach where you encrypt the connection between your phone and your SIP server through, uh, well, the, the session key. Here's how, here's how it works. Uh, your phone generates a random session key. It sends it through a TLS tunnel to your SIP server. Uh, your SIP server sends it through a TLS tunnel to um, your, your, your VoIP service provider. Maybe they're both the same. That sends it through another TLS tunnel to the other party's um, service provider. And then that sends it to uh, his phone through another TLS tunnel. Well, now he has the session key, which means you're ready to encrypt the media between the phones, the, vo the packet, the stream of voice packets. Um, well, the problem is now everyone in between, the, the phone companies in between have the key as well. And so they're able to listen to the call. Now, perhaps you trust your own phone company. Uh, I personally don't trust my own phone company, but maybe maybe you do. But what about the phone company of the other party? If you're calling someone in China, the phone company in China is going to be very cooperative with the Chinese government. And they're going to hand over the keys to the Chinese government, and the Chinese government will be able to monitor that phone call. So I, I don't think this is a good architecture. This is, in fact, the worst way to encrypt VoIP. Um, I think anything that relies on the servers is a, is a bad idea. What it should be is the two parties should be negotiating the keys directly between them. Uh, and ZRTP does that. It does a Diffie-Hellman exchange uh, between the two parties and um, negotiates a session key and then encrypts the session key with SRTP. Um, and um, 
It uses the AES for SRTP. It uses Diffie-Hellman for the key negotiation. It creates the keys at the start of the call and destroys them at the end of the call. So if somebody, um, you know, uh, gets a hold of your laptop computer after after you finish the call, uh, they're not going to be able to pull any any bits out of it that will let them reconstruct the call or decrypt the call retroactively. The keys are gone. Now, um, in order to protect against a man-in-the-middle attack, um, you have to make sure that you're using the same session key as the other party. Because a man-in-the-middle attack works like this. Um, Alice tries to call Bob, and um, normally, if there's no man-in-the-middle attack, the two parties negotiate a key, and they're both using the same session key at both ends. There's a, an encrypted link between them. But um, imagine if uh, the man in the middle has put himself in the middle so that when Alice is trying to call Bob, she's actually calling the man in the middle. She doesn't realize this. And the man in the middle then calls Bob, and Bob thinks the call is coming from Alice. So now there's two separate encrypted connections, one between Alice and the man in the middle, the other one between the man in the middle and Bob. And um, now Alice and Bob are talking to each other, but the man in the middle can listen to their conversation. Because in the middle, the, it's been already decrypted from Alice and then re-encrypted to go to Bob. So there's two session keys. Now, how do you tell that you both parties are not using the same session key? Well, I uh, compute a hash of, um, of I compute a hash that's derived from the Diffie-Hellman exchange and display it. As you can see up on the screen, um, next to the uh, next to the window, next to me, over here, or over here, or I don't know where I I don't know what the screen looks like from where you're sitting, but there is this um, Z phone window that says compare with partner, and it says classroom phonetic. I don't know if all of you can see that, um, but th that. That means that th those words are <clears throat> derived from the Diffie-Hellman exchange. If they match on your side, it means there's no man in the middle. But uh, if there was a man in the middle, they would not match. Uh, and that's how we detect um, a man in the middle attack. Uh, the man in the middle attack is, is the attack that everyone tries to guard against. It's, it's pretty much the only vulnerability that... Uh, um, well, it's not the only vulnerability. There's other things they they might infect your computer with a virus or something like that. But as far as as a um, you know as as the low hanging fruit for how to attack um, a man in the middle attack is the easiest thing to do, and this protects against that. So, um, but you know, most people are going to be too lazy to check the short authentication string, so they're just not going to bother. And that's okay, because most of the time you're not talking about secret stuff, so you don't really need to check it. Well, but if you look down at the bottom, um, you see uh, uh, where it says secure audio and secure video? Beneath that it says secure since, and then it gives a timestamp. Uh, 2008, 525, uh, and it probably says uh, 1836. That means that that's actually the first time I made a secure connection uh, with uh, Stefan Wintermeyer. And what we did is we cached some key material. How many people here use SSH? Yeah? Okay, that's a, that's a number of people. How many people don't use SSH? Hey, now, there's some problem with the math here. I'm not seeing the, the people that didn't raise their hand in the first question did not raise their hand in the second question. Something's not adding up here. <laughs> okay, let me try again. How many people here use SSH? Wow, all of you suddenly started using SSH, probably from your laptop computers while you're listening to my lecture, right? You just got your first introduction to SSH. <laughs> okay, so... You know that the first time you use SSH to connect to uh, a computer, a remote computer, that there's it, it, it captures some key material and it caches it, and uh, and then uh, later on when you when you make another connection to the same computer, it uses this key material in the cache to um, protect against a man in the middle attack uh, on all the subsequent connections that you make. Um, well, that means that. If there was going to be a man-in-the-middle attack, it would have to be on the first connection.